everyone. Uh, happy day three of DevCon 6. Um, before we get started today, I uh, just want to send a huge shout out to all the organizers, um, all the people that came from all over the world, uh, and everyone who is at this talk today. Um, so I appreciate it. So today, um, I'm Colin Myers. I'm co-founder of Obo Labs with Oshin. Um, and today, we are going to discuss designing DVT for non-correlation. Um, so before we get started, who is Obo Labs? Uh, best way to think of us is that we're an R&D team. We're focused on building a different Ethereum infrastructure technologies for staking. Uh, today, the core team consists of 16 members across eight countries, so we're quite distributed. Um, right now, our main focus is delivering distributed validator technology for Ethereum uh, as a primary network to begin with. So before we dive a little bit deeper in today, let's kind of talk about just Ethereum as a whole and kind of the, the roadmap of scalability. So, a lot of it, we just had the merge, and if anyone went to the opening ceremonies, you know, there's this um, ossification discussion happening, which is essentially like hardening the things that we've put together, the things that we've created. Uh, and what we see here are the three main areas that we've been focusing on um, over the past few years to scale Ethereum into its next chapter. So on the left here, the first uh, area is the execution layer. This is the most mature of all the different scalability technologies and research studies that have been done over the years. Um, Cryptographic primitives that are used for this problem are optimistic and ZK rollups. Uh, this comes through in the form of layer two. Um, it's actually been quite interesting this week to see that layer two is taking over um, as they should. And layer two, honestly, in my eyes, seems to be the future of, of what Ethereum will build out of from a research perspective. Uh, the second area uh, ties to layer two. Um, and as it matures more, we are getting in front of the next problem, which is the data layer. Uh, so the data layer must also scale while execution scales. Um, Common methodologies used for this is called data availability sampling, uh, and, and here are uh, some examples of some few projects that are focusing on that. The third piece, which is kind of the most immature, uh, and not only like research and adoption and implementation, is scaling the consensus layer. Um, like scaling consensus to date has basically been uh, getting to Genesis and then getting to the merge. And now that we're in this post-merge world, we're all kind of re-evaluating the consensus layer uh, and saying, how do we scale it more? Today, what we're using is DBT uh, as a cryptographic primitive and protocol to help scale the consensus layer. Now I'm going to take a moment to describe what distributed validator technology is in a bit more words. So. At its most simple, a distributed validator is an Ethereum validator that runs across multiple machines. Um, why you might want to do this is it protects you from a lot of technical and social risks from validation. Um, one of the first ones is software issues. If you're running just one node and just one software client, you know, software generally doesn't like run forever without issue. Um, similarly, um, running in a distributed validator makes you more protected from hardware risks. As everyone kind of expects, servers don't last forever and they die regularly enough. Um, going one bit further, if you take a distributed validator and you run it with other people, so each person only has you know, a subset of the private key, that makes private key much more difficult, uh, private key compromise much more difficult because you have to compromise three or more different operators to get the full private key to you know, slash or do whatever with it. And the last one is a bit more abstract, but it's the idea of if your validator goes haywire, they become a bad actor, they've been hacked, remote code execution, whatever you'd like. Um, generally, you have no safeguard if you just have all of your money with one validator. It's just you're in trouble. But if you have your money in a distributed validator, um, you have protection so long as only a subset of validators you know, become Byzantine or go AWOL or whatever you want to call it. Um, another thing that's super important is to talk about who benefits from DVT. Um, the great thing about it is we think more or less everyone involved in validation can benefit from it. Um, the liquid staking providers themselves, they at the moment are trusting huge amounts of stake onto single operators, and they're just kind of crossing their fingers and praying that nothing bad happens. They would much prefer to be able to, dis to divide their stake across operator, and then if you know, anything bad happens to one, there's you know, no risk or no loss to the liquid staking protocol. Similarly, the centralized providers can gain a lot from using distributed validator technology. I had the pleasure of building Block Demon's ETH2 staking platform um, at Genesis, and I know that you, know, you could reduce um, DevOps risk of you know, you have to wake them up in the middle of the night when a machine dies if you, know, you have a distributed validator. 
Similarly, you can reduce your hardware cost because most people put a very small amount of validators per any given machine because if it goes offline, there's nothing you can do. But if you have a fault tolerant validator, you can start to safely increase the amount of keys per node and that can reduce your operating costs. And then on the more extreme or like the further out there side of things, a lot of centralized operators either ensure their stake against slashing, either on balance sheet or they go to a third party provider for insurance. Um, this is currently extremely expensive and not even every provider offers it because the thing to ensure in a slashing is, you know, potentially you have to pay back everyone, like all of that stake. So if you have an operator with hundreds of millions of dollars and an insurer has to potentially pay all of that stake, you're going to have a really high premium. But if you are instead running a distributed validator and, you know, insurer says, okay, what's going to happen if they get compromised? The, um, you know, the, the worst case scenario was much lower and as a result, the premium is hopefully going to be much lower. The next thing I want to do is want to have Colin talk a bit about the market for distributed validators. Cool. So how is stake accumulating? Um, these were taken from uh, Elias from Rated, uh, his liquid staking dashboard on Dune. Um, data in this area, for, for those of you watching and who have, were looking at data, um, this is probably some of the best data on the status of pools and, and how they've accumulated over time, and I would highly recommend it. Um, so where are we at today? Um, this chart here starts on the left at Genesis, which was December 2020, uh, and it shows the, the dramatic increase uh, in pooled assets as a percentage of total staked assets over time. Um, so as we can see, it's, it's kind of quite frankly like you know, exponentially growing. Um, today, numbers, where are we? There's about 6 million ETH locked in pools. Um, that equates to around $8 billion today. Uh, and it represents nearly 37% of stake in the network. So the 37% of stake in the network is like probably the most important thing I want to touch on as it ties to like what our thesis is, which ties to how we believe DBT should be designed. Um, we believe that over the next 12 to 18 months that pooling will become dominant uh, inside of most networks, especially Ethereum, and we suspect that more than two thirds of stake in the near future uh, will be inside of pools. DBT is uh, today on the focal roadmap of pools to help decentralize and to help build themselves out. Um, therefore, we believe that DVT saturation inside of these pools uh, will also uh, end up being 75% plus. Um, lastly, this is important because DVT is ultimately a security protocol. Uh, it comes in a middleware, um, however, it's based upon security. So different than MEV Boost, right? You use MEV Boost to get more. Uh, with DVT, you use it to protect the largest reward, which is consensus rewards. We believe that DVT adoption will be kind of a winner-take-all market due to its like security premises um, and the purpose of what it's used for. So to kind of set the tone before we go into correlation here, I just wanted to, to give a size of the market, our expectations of how DVT will sit inside of pools, and then how large pools will be as a percentage of total stake. Uh, therefore, if, if this thesis does play out, it's incredibly important that DVT stays helpful at scale uh, instead of becoming more correlated and unhelpful. So now we'll spend a little bit of time on slashing, uh, what it is and what it isn't. So slashing. Um, the best way to think of slashing, for, for those of you, as if it's a new concept, is uh, slashing is like the defense mechanism or the immune system uh, of proof-of-stake networks. Uh, and what it's here to do, it's, it's, punish, it's here to punish you for not following the rules in an attempt to keep the network credible and to follow the rules of the protocol. Uh, today, there's two primary ways uh, to get slashed. Uh, the first one is a double sign. Uh, back in proof of work, this was called a double spend. Uh, and this has been mostly predominantly um, what the top slashing event in the network to date has been through. Uh, and we'll get into like how, how that's happened. Uh, the second one is a bit more abstract. Um, best way to think of it is walking back a slot height that you previously said was finalized. Now, a more layman's term way of describing this is uh, in the future, you try to change something that you said was true in the past. Uh, so therefore, you're trying to like change state uh, inside of the network. And if you do that, you will be slashed for it. Inside of slashing, there are different levels and degrees of slashing. Uh, there is correlated slashing and uncorrelated slashing. Uh, uncorrelated slashing uh, today is predominantly the, the most of what's taken place in the network. We've been fortunate enough on mainnet to not see a large um, correlated event, uh, aside from maybe a couple small incidents. Uh, and in an uncorrelated sense, uh, you can expect to, to lose up to a minimum of one ETH um, based on the state of what's happening in the network. 
Um, when it comes to correlated slashing, uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time digging into it, um, but what everyone needs to know is, is that um, in the event of like a, a network-wide event, uh, correlated slashing can result in a validator losing all of their ether uh, up to 32. Uh, which is much more of a catastrophic event. So as we begin to like look at the future of slashing, uh, there's certain technologies, best practices that have kind of gotten over this uncorrelated slashing. We'll definitely see a few in the network. It's okay. Uh, but now what we need to begin to prepare for is as like stake scales and there's more products and more infrastructure providers, how do we prevent correlated slashing? Because it's like what could take the whole network down uh, or take all of validator stake. Okay, so what is an activity penalty? Um, this is super important because it's not slashing. Um, many people who are coming into the space now uh, try to say that inactivity is a slashable offense. Uh, by definition, it's not. Um, and the way that we should think about inactivity is um, if your machine goes offline, it's okay. You can take the time to bring it back up online and you, are, you can expect to lose um, what you would have made. So there is a penalty associated with it, uh, but it's not a slashing, and it's not because you broke the rules. Uh, it's just due to downtime. Um, inactivity can also be more severe uh, in scale. Um, so if a large portion of the network is inactive, um, a big driving force in the ETH2 economics and design is this uh, average percent uptime in the network. So if that drops below 66, the inactivity penalty across the whole network will grow and grow and grow in an attempt to push Ether out to rebalance it to get back to 66%. So when it comes to inactivity, large inactivity events will result in sizable uh, offenses for people, still don't want to call them slashings, but you can think of this mechanism as a way to rebalance the system to promote 66% of machines to turn their machines back on. Now we've discussed a bit what is distributed validator technology, what it's useful for, and then we like, you know, had a bit of a refresher on slashing and inactivity. Now we'd like to discuss how we at Opal have made certain design decisions to minimize the correlation risk. Because as we said, the title of this slide is, or this talk is how not to make things worse when we're trying to make them better. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the private keys. Because you know, in a validator, the private keys are more or less everything. Um, we've taken the decision to not allow any one entity to have the full private key. That's not the customer, that's not any one operator. Um, instead, all the operators come together and they do a distributed key generation, which means they all take part in a bit of a protocol and they like, contribute some entropy to it. And at the end, they all get their private keys and they get a proof that everyone like, took part and followed the rules fairly. But there was never any moment where one person had the full private key for the validator. This is super important because if somebody does, you know, they can run it in a validator and get you slashed. Um, we don't put these private keys, you know, more or less anywhere. They're created on the machine where the validator will run. We don't encrypt them and put them on chain or leave them anywhere, anywhere where people could attack and compromise a large number of them. Um, to follow through with that, once we've helped create these validator private keys, we don't actually keep control over them. Um, Caron, which is the name of the software Opal has written, is a non-custodial middleware, which is a fancy way of saying it doesn't have the private keys, it just asks the validator to sign something for it. Um, it sits in between the um, it sits in between the beacon client and the like the beacon API and a validator client, and it intercepts the traffic going between them. Um, your current clients, um, all they really do is they play a consensus game and they say, "What are we going to ask the validators to sign?" And once they come to consensus on that, they present that to each validator. Every validator says, OK, let me check my slashing rules. Have I already signed something at this height? No, OK, that's good. Have I said finality was further than what I'm being asked to say? No, OK, sweet. I'm not going to get slashed. I'll sign this message, and I'll send it back to what I think is the beacon node. We are actually sitting as a middleware there. We intercept that signature. We gossip them to the other different like, nodes in the cluster. And once any of them have enough of the partial signatures, they can, reconstruct, they can reconstruct the aggregate signature and send it on to the network. And the rest of the network says, yep, that's just a normal validator. It looks good to me. What's nice about this middleware and not having the private keys is you know, if we are compromised, the worst we can do is show something slashable to a validator client. But we get to rely on the fact that the validator clients are independent, have their own code, probably don't have the same bugs, and you know, are not going to sign anything slashable, um, most likely. However, if you only had just one validator client, there is a scenario where you, know, you find a zero day in that, and you can convince them to, to sign something slashable. So one of the things we've been very focused on is being multi-client. And what that means is you can run any of the validators that implement the spec 
Um, specifically, we're still working on support for all of them, but you can use Lighthouse and Teku already. And generally speaking, in an enterprise operator like distributed validator, you want to have a mix of all the different ELs, all the different CLs, all the different validator clients. Because if there is you know, a, a bug in a client, uh, you don't want it to have a majority of your distributed validator, because then it will sign and you might get slashed. And the only data point we have for a client bug like this was when Prism had a timing bug back in the Madasha testnet. And that was the most severe slashings across any testnet or mainnet uh, to date. And yeah, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is the networking side of things. So um, over the last three design decisions we talked about, we said, how are we going to set up the private keys? You know, how do we keep them maximally safe, step one? Then step two is, how do we keep our software you know, out of the driver's seat? We don't want to have total control over these private keys, because if we can sign arbitrary data, that's a threat. You, know, you don't want you know, something running more than 33% of the network if you know, they can sign whatever without you know, any oversight. The third piece is obviously our multi-client implementation. Trying not to have exposure to any one piece of implementation makes you more like, resilient to bugs and makes you less correlated. And then the last one is more on the inactivity side. So the three before have been all about preventing slashing, preventing slashing, preventing slashing. But we also try and prevent downtime, of course. If you're running a highly available validator, the pitch is that you're going to be up more often than if you're on a solo node. And similarly, if we had a distributed validator architecture where something goes wrong and we knocked off every distributed validator all at once, the inactivity penalties would be rather severe, and we would make things worse when we were trying to make them better. So how we have architected Karen's networking stack is they are totally independent from one another. Uh, one group of people running a distributed validator over here has no common infrastructure with someone running it over in a separate place. Uh, we think this is super important because it allows you to have non-correlation effectively. If the alternative to this was if you kind of bound all of these together into a shared like networking layer, like message bus or, or gossip network, the problem with that is, well, for a start, it's usually slower. You have to go multiple hops around the internet. And with a distributed validator, time is money. So you don't want to be doing that. Um, but also, if anything happens to this network, you knock off all distributed validators simultaneously. And that's something that we don't want to do. So if you have a scenario where every distributed validator has their own independent network networking, um, you know, if anything does go wrong, they go wrong separately. And the nice piece about this is, you know, going through this like effort of making everyone set up new no like set up new networking is definitely a bit more hassle. But the benefit of having independent clusters is you can also have independent versioning. And what I mean by that is, you know, one of the scariest things in software development is releasing an update because you're not really sure it's going to work. And it's particularly scary if you're securing billions of dollars. Um, so the last thing we want to do is introduce a correlated outage by pushing a new version. Um, it is you know, pragmatic to assume that you know, you'll push a broken version at some point. We saw Geth do it last month, and you know, they're probably the most experienced team in the space. So it can more or less happen to anyone. You shouldn't assume you're just not going to do it. So instead, you're like, OK, if we did push a bad version, like how, you know, how can we minimize the issues? And this is where having independent networking comes in. If you have one cluster that's totally separate to another one, you can update that one to version two and see what happens. And if that's all healthy, great. You can update a second, and a third, and a fourth. And you can gradually roll out this update across the network. And if anything goes wrong, you can kind of abort, and you can kind of panic. If you go the other way of we have shared messaging, and you know, everyone has to talk the same protocol, you have to do what the kind of ELs and CLs do, which is you pick a slot number, and you release a new version, and you like add everyone on Discord, and you pray to God that they have running the new version in time. Because if they're not running the new version, they go offline. And you also pray that the version is right, because if there's anything wrong with it, you knock everybody else off as well. So yeah, the inactivity side of things, the, like the penalties aren't as severe, but it is also super important to us when designing distributed validators not to make things worse when we're trying to make them better. And I'm going to hand it back to Colin for the last few closing thoughts. Cool. Yeah, so to close it down, um, again, appreciate everyone coming out. Um, DVT is this. I guess, well, we've been working on it quite a long time, but since uh, ETH Denver at the beginning of this year, it's really now be begun to have its turn, essentially, of adoption. Um, our North Star as a project today, what we're most focused on is convincing everyone that validators are communities, not individuals. Um, today, the way that the network topography sits is validators are a single key, validators are a single person, or validators are a single entity. Uh, and with this technology, we can migrate that paradigm into validators being run predominantly by communities. 
Um, so we have about five minutes left. Um, again, since DBT has kind of been this new topic that's been introduced over the past few months, we wanted to make sure we take time to answer anyone's questions. Uh, and again, thanks everyone for coming out. Pushing uh, and incentivizing people to um, have diversity in where the machines are is actually the real problem there, right? Um, there's a variety of validators, large ones, that, that choose to run on-prem. There's a variety that, that choose to run in the cloud. Um, we were at dinner last night, and the menu was running on, you know, US Amazon East 2. And we just laughed, because, like, everyone's running on US Amazon East 2. So there are, like, other types of correlated problems with internet usage um, that we necessarily can't fight, um, but still susceptible to them. Uh, I was wondering about the DKG itself, about uh, the ceremony. And uh, how do you think about uh, the risk that there is some problem with some data, data centers or something, and somehow, like at one point, two out of four keys get lost? Like, how, how probable do you think this is? And uh, what do you think about possible mitigations to, to this problem? Yeah, this is a very good question. And this is um, usually referred to as like verifiable secret sharing in like academia. And this is the thing of doing a DKG is one thing, but how do you know it actually worked? How do you know that you know, everyone actually contributed, everyone got a piece like they expected? And usually there are two types of ways to prove a DKG is fair. They're called verifiable secret sharing and publicly verifiable secret sharing. But ultimately speaking, at the end of a DKG, everyone that's taking part, they get a private key and they get a proof. In a verifiable secret share, you need to have one of the private keys to check the proof. In a publicly verifiable secret share, it's like a zero knowledge proof. Anyone can just check that it's verified. So yes, it is actually super important to make sure that everyone took part. And usually, there's like challenge rounds built into DKG, which says, you know, does everything look right? Does anyone want to hit the abort? Or is everyone going to like sign off on this? And yeah, at the end of a DKG, normally there's a proof. I think right now we have a VSS proof, meaning only the peers know it was legit. But ultimately, we would like to add a zero knowledge proof. So even like you know, the Izzy at Lido can say, yeah, those four operators definitely did the DKG correctly because they wouldn't have been able to produce a ZK proof otherwise. For sure. So the question, because he's not mic'd up, was you know, what happens if people lose you know, more than a subset of keys? And honestly, the answer is if you lose you know, more than the threshold, you're probably, gonna, you're probably out of luck, to be perfectly honest. So generally speaking, that's why you want four different operators, and they should all make you know, independent backups. If you have two operators that didn't make backups and left them in the same data center and everything blew up, uh, yeah, that's probably a big problem, to be perfectly honest. Um, and yeah, that would be one of the ways where forced exits would be nice, because then the person that the withdrawal a key could be like, uh-oh, please send it back to me. But what would realistically happen is right now, you'd be offline, and you'd be offline until you hit 16 Ether and get kicked out. So yes, if people don't back up their private keys, you know, even in a distributed validator, if you lose you know, too many of the private keys, you're still screwed.